So thank you for joining us today again. This is the third and third and last session of this uh, webinar series entitled Monitoring Aquatic uh, Vegetation with Remote Sensing. And my name is Juan Torres Perez, and as always, I'm joined today by Amber McCollum. And today, we also have two very special uh, invited speakers from the University of Puerto Rico, Drs. Uh, Roy Armstrong and Dr. William Hernandez, who will be talking about different efforts being conducted to assess the presence and effects of sargasso mats along the shorelines of Puerto Rico and some remote sensing, sensing techniques as well to detect sargassum. I just wanted to remind you again that this is a three, uh, one hour, hour and a half sessions uh, on July 12, 14, and today on the 19th. And as always, the same content uh, is presented in two different languages, uh, in, the, in English and in Spanish. And you can just sign up for one of them and attend uh, whichever you prefer. And uh, as always, the webinar recordings, the PowerPoint presentations, and the homework assignment uh, uh, can be find, found on the uh, website here shown on the screen, which is the website for this webinar. And if by any chance during the Q&A session, we're not able to uh, get to your particular question, feel free to send us an email to either myself or to Amber to the email shown on the screen here, and we will answer them as soon as possible. I also want to remind you again that there's only one homework for assignment for this webinar, and all the answers will be submitted via Google Forms. And this is today is the last day of this webinar series, so the homework will be in the on the course uh, website, and you will have two weeks from today to submit the the homework. So, uh, which means that you have until August or the, August the second to submit the homework. And remember that if you attend um, uh, the live webinars. And if you also submit your homework, eventually you will get a certificate of completion. But also, as a I want to remind you again that because of the, the particularly large amount of participants that we typically get during these uh, webinars, and thanks again for participating, it usually takes about two to three months for uh, to receive the, the certificate of completion. But again, if you if you attended the webinars and you completed the homework, submitted the homework, you will eventually get your certificate. Also, as a reminder, if uh, there's a prerequisite of the fundamentals of remote sensing for those of you who are not familiar with remote sensing techniques. But if you have an, uh, the equivalent experience, that also counts. You don't, you don't necessarily need to, to take the fundamentals of remote sensing if you have uh, uh, experience, previous experience with remote, remote sensing. And uh, also, I uh, want to remind you again that all the courses materials will be here, uh, or you, you can access them on the, on the course web page. Now, let's go into the learning, learning objectives for this particular session. Uh, we expect that at the end of the session, you will be familiarized with the uh, sargassum seaweed, the uh, benefits, importance, and even impacts uh, in different coastlines. Um, you will also be familiarized with the what's been called the Caribbean Atlantic sargassum patch. It's pretty much the world's largest harmful algal bloom. And also with some remote sensing techniques and in-situ sampling uh, techniques as well for mapping the extent and prevalence of sargassum, the sargassum patch. And also uh, we'll talk about multi-scale sensors and algorithms to detect sargassum. Um, uh, some of my colleagues will mention briefly the sargassum watch system, which is managed by Dr. Shaming Hu from the uh, University of South Florida. Okay, now uh, let's go into a brief overview of the uh, Caribbean Atlantic Sargassum Patch. And for that, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we have a very, very special guest, Dr. Rory Armstrong from the University of Puerto Rico, who will give us a summary of what's, been, what's happening with Sargassum and what's been happening with Sargassum in the last decade or so. So Roy, take it away. Thank you, Juan. My name is Roy Armstrong, and today my colleague William Hernandez and I will be talking about different aspects of sargassum biology, ecology, detection, and characterization. 
Our research on sargassum, funded by NASA's MUREP program, addresses the impacts of sargassum on tropical marine communities using remote sensing technologies. The Olfita are brown color algae that contain several pigments that gives them their characteristic color. The genus Sargassum contains about 150 different species of brown algae, which are generally attached to rocks along temperate coasts or as pelagic free-floating algae in the open ocean. Pelagic Sargassum is a genus of brown microalgae that floats freely on the surface of the ocean. Pelagic sargassum multiplies by vegetative uh, fragmentation. The talus breaks into fragments due to mechanical injury or death and decay of older parts. Some of the most important morphological characteristics of sargassum includes a highly branched talus and small and leaf-like fronds with tooth edges. Sargassum floats with the help of nematocysts which are gas-filled structures that provide flotation. They serve as adaptive bladders, which are designed for floating photosynthetic parts near or on the water surface for harvesting light. In this uh, picture here, notice the camouflaged sargassum swimming crab, Portunus sagi, in the center of the photo. In the Caribbean Sea, we find two species of sargassum, sargassum natans and sargassum fluitans. These two species are holopelagic, which means they spend their whole life history floating in the ocean. Sargassum fluitans have oblong floating bladders or pneumatoses, while sargassum natans have spherical pneumatoses. Within the same species of sargassum natans, one form has spines in the pneumatoses, that's form one, and the other form, form eight, lacks the spine. Sargassum natans has smooth stems, while fluitans have spines on the stem. Sargassum can form large floating rafts that can stretch for miles across the ocean. This floating habitat provides food, refuge, and breeding grounds for a large number of organisms such as fish, sea turtles, marine birds, crabs, shrimp, and more. Some organisms, such as the sargassum fish, Histrio histrio, lives their entire lives within the sargassum. If you look carefully, uh, you can see a camouflaged sargassum fish in the bottom picture. In terms of fisheries, the floating sargassum serves as the primary nursery area for a variety of commercially important fish, such as dolphin fish or mahi-mahi, jacks, and amberjacks. Since sargassum provides refuge for migratory species and serves as the essential habitat for some 120 species of fish, and more than 120 species of invertebrates. In 2003, it was designated as essential fish habitat within the U.S. exclusive economic zone of the Southern Atlantic states. Essential fish habitat includes all types of aquatic habitat where fish spawn, breed, feed, or grow to maturity. The photo on the right illustrates the diversity and abundance of organisms that sargassum can support while in the open sea. Sargassum islands or floating mats can be a mile wide and several feet deep. This drone picture shows several sargassum patches reaching coral reefs and coastal areas in southwestern Puerto Rico. Sargassum can survive a wide range of temperature and salinity. In the open ocean, where sargassum loses its buoyancy after about a year, it sinks to the seafloor and provides energy to ocean life on the seafloor. Floating sargassum mats provide many benefits, such as serving as an oasis in the desolate open ocean environment supporting a high level of biodiversity. It contributes an estimated 60% of the total primary production in the upper one meter of the water column. 
egg and larval stages of fish, some crustaceans and juvenile sea turtles are particularly dependent upon the pelagic sargassum habitat for survival. Sargassum can also be a, uh, used as plant fertilizer, but it needs to be tested for heavy metals before using in home gardens and food crops. It is a good source of alginates, which are used in the food, cosmetic, medical, and pharmaceutical industries. Alginates can also be converted into biofuels and bioplastics. Before 2011, the only source of floating sargassum was the Sargasso Sea in the North Central Atlantic Ocean. However, in the winter of 2009-2010, changing wind patterns associated to extreme North Atlantic oscillation advected sargassum to the Eastern Atlantic Ocean. In the spring, the sargassum was transported to the Caribbean Sea by the North Equatorial Current and southward by the Canary Current, creating a new source of sargassum in the tropical Eastern Atlantic Ocean off of Africa. Since 2011 to the present, this is the source of sargassum that reaches the Caribbean Sea and Gulf of Mexico each spring and summer. The factors responsible for the creation of this new source of sargassum were published by Dr. Elizabeth Johns and collaborators in 2020. The magnitude and geographical extent of the seasonal intrusion of sargassum in the Caribbean Sea and Gulf of Mexico is best, is best shown by satellites. It is now known as the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt. This composite satellite product uses a floating algal index created by doctors Wang and Hu from Florida State University and provides an estimate of the density of sargassum in kilograms per meter square. In 2018, we experienced the, large, the largest sargassum bloom in history, as you can see in this satellite image. Also, for the first time, we had sargassum blooms throughout the year in the Caribbean Sea. The amount of sargassum in 2018 was estimated at over 20 million tons, creating the world's largest harmful algal bloom in history, covering an area of over 6,000 square kilometers. The figure in the bottom right shows the mean monthly sargassum area coverage in the Caribbean Sea and Central Atlantic in square kilometers. The peak years have been 2015, 2018, 2019, and 2021. Sargassum abundance in the year 2021 was as large as in the year 2018. So what are the drivers of the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt? First, riverine sources of nutrients include the large runoff from the Amazon, Orinoco, and Congo rivers that includes fertilizers used in agriculture. Second, the position, especially wet deposition of Saharan dust plumes during rains provides input of iron and phosphates in the Atlantic Ocean. Also, upwelling from the coast of Africa could be important. And climate variables such as higher sea surface water temperatures and heavier rainfall events and others can also be contributing factors. Even though floating sargassum is very beneficial in the open ocean, once it reaches coastal areas and becomes stranded on beaches and other environments, it creates a huge problem. This image shows sargassum stranding on beaches on eastern Puerto Rico on the left, and in the northwest part of the island on the bottom right image. It impacts tourism and marine recreation activities, and therefore the economy of island nations in the Caribbean, Central America, and the Gulf of Mexico. Sargassum accumulation also impacts other tropical marine ecosystems, such as fringing mangrove forests, seagrass beds, and coral reefs. Once sargassum accumulates and decomposes, it releases hydrogen sulfide and ammonium, which are toxic gases, 
and depletes oxygen in the water column, causing fish mortalities due to anoxic conditions. Sargassum accumulation on beaches is a direct threat to turtle nesting. It also reduces slide penetration in the water column, which is important for seagrasses, coral reefs, and other benthic communities. Overall, sargassum accumulation, decomposition, and sinking in shallow coastal areas causes a biodiversity loss in tropical marine ecosystems. It can also be a source of heavy metals, such as arsenic and cadmium, to the marine environment. These are examples of sargassum accumulation and impacts on coral reefs. The left photograph show sargassum accumulation on the shallow reef flat areas of a reef in southwestern Puerto Rico. The photo on the right shows sargassum already accumulated on the reef crest of a reef with more sargassum approaching the area. We have very little information on the impacts of sargassum in coral reefs since it does not tend to accumulate for long on shallow reef areas. On the other hand, we have seen dramatic impacts of sargassum accumulation and decomposition on fringing red mangroves and associated seagrass beds. As previously mentioned, sargassum can have a large impact on the economy of Caribbean sea islands and nations that depend heavily on tourism for their economy. This includes declined tourism, disrupted coastal operations in ports, marinas, even power plants that use seawater for cooling. Also disrupted recreation and fishing and ecosystem services, and can also have a high cleanup cost. Beach sargassum can also have an impact on public health. For example, Prolonged contact with sargassum or inhaling the hydrogen sulfide gas can cause irritation of respiratory tract, shortness of breath, dizziness, vertigo, nausea, headaches, and neurological and cardiovascular changes. Contact with sargassum can cause skin rashes due to the presence of hydroids with stinging nematocysts. And finally, heavy metals are toxic in high concentrations. So we have seen how sargassum can support a high biodiversity and serve as essential habitat in the open ocean. However, once it accumulates on beaches and other coastal areas, it can have a severe impact on tropical marine ecosystems. It also affects the economy of many Caribbean islands and other countries in the greater Caribbean region, as well as potentially impacting human health. For these reasons, sargassum is now considered the largest recurring harmful algal bloom in the world. I will leave you now with Dr. William Hernandez, who will talk to you about sargassum observations and analysis using remote sensing. Thanks, Roy, and thank you for the opportunity to present some of our research work here. My name is William Hernandez, I am currently a researcher with the University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez, and currently working uh, with sargassum in coastal areas. In a sponsored project both by NASA and Europe Ocean and Sea Grant University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez. And I'm going to talk about how we use remote sensing for sargassum detection, analysis, and assessment of impacts in nearshore ecosystems. Also, how we combine optical data and water quality measurements using field instrumentation with remote sensing tools and images to better understand the acute and chronic effects of sargassum in coastal areas. For the remote sensing tools, we are using a multi-scale approach based on the spatial resolution of the sensors. Here, we have four examples of different spatial resolutions for a sargassum inundation event that occurred in 2018. The image in the top left, we have a Modis Aqua alternate floating LG index, AFI, in products at one kilometer spatial resolution. We'll discuss a little bit more about that floating LG index in the next couple of slides, but I would like to show and highlight the different sargassum patches present around Puerto Rico, which is centered on the image. The green color and yellow and red colors indicate sargassum patches present 
near the coastal areas around Puerto Rico. The red box indicates the area in the southwest Puerto Rico, and it's enhanced in the next image to the right using a Landsat 8 false color image for the same date, but at 30 meter spatial resolution. And that box that you see there is further enhanced by a Worldview 3 image, which is processed here at uh, one foot or 0.33 meters spatial resolution. And for that same event, we also collected a drone image that provided, in this case, centimeter scale images. So using this approach, you can observe the same event, even the same sargassum patches, as you can see from the different images for the same dates, at various spatial scales. Each one can provide important information about the location and inundation of sargassum in these areas. Based on our knowledge of remote sensing, we can exploit the spectral signature of vegetation, and in this case, for sargassum. So in the graph, we see a spectral curve of sargassum showing peak reflectance in the green-red region of the spectrum and a higher peak in the near-infrared region of the spectrum. The y-axis show the reflectance values and the x-axis show the wavelength in nanometers. With this information, we can now develop algorithms to detect and separate floating vegetation like sargassum, you see on the right, pictures on the right, from the background, in this case, the ocean surface. Another important aspect of knowing, in this case, for not only the spectral information, is also the sensors that we're using. And in this case, here's a table that show various modern resolution satellite sensors like MODIS Aqua and Terra and VIRS, which provide daily images and have the spectral bands necessary that we can use to develop these floating algae indices. And in this case, as an example, we're showing the different bands that are used for the alternate floating algae index, which we'll talk very briefly, shortly. So based on that spectral response of sargassum, the floating algae index was developed by Shuangming Hu as a rapid assessment algorithm tool to detect floating algae. On the left is a MODIS Aqua image using the floating algae index, or PHI, and you can distinguish the sargassum patches from the open ocean in the background. These patches are very similar to the image seen in the bottom right of the slide. The graph on the right shows the rally corrected reflectance in the y-axis and the wavelength in the x-axis, where the red line indicates the spectral signature of the algae and the blue line represents the spectral signature from water, which we can, you can clearly see and differentiate specifically at 159 nanometers. So based on this, you can uh, separate the information from water in the background and from the algae on top. The modus spectral bands used for the floating algae index are shown here for reference. But one limitation of the floating algae index was that it was that it used the band in the short wet infrared region of the spectrum at 1240 nanometers. And that region is very sensitive to clouds. So the algorithm gets confused very easily with clouds in certain locations. And to overcome this, this difficulty, the alternate floating algae index was developed, which was generated using the same floating algae in this algorithm design, but using different spectral bands. For example, uh, changing that short wave infrared band to 869 nanometers to avoid that cloud uh, confusion in terms of the floating algae index. In this case, the image on the left is showing the alternate floating algae index from MODIS in the central Atlantic, and the graph shown in the right again shows again the average spectral signature for sargassum, in this case with top and bottom standard deviations. So you can see again that spectral signature in the green-red region of the spectrum, and then a higher peak in the near-infrared region of the spectrum. 
here's an AFI or alternate floating algae index image for May 4, 2022, so a couple of months ago, showing the Northeast Caribbean, but it's centered on Puerto Rico. And you can see sargassum patches present around the island in the open ocean. And the, uh, the bottom right part of the image close to Waterloo. The blackout areas represent clouds, which in this case are max, masked out, but these clouds can limit the detection of sargassum. So to overcome this, we combine daily images like, th like this one into weekly, monthly, and yearly estimates of sargassum presence and accumulation in the Caribbean and Central Atlantic. So where we can find these images? There are a couple of options that we can use. The Optical Oceanography Lab from the University of, of South Florida, uh, which is directed by Dr. Sean ming -Hu, has available what is called the Sargassum Watch System, where you can download daily alternate floating algae index products already processed for all moderate resolution sensors, including MODIS, VIRS, and Sentinel-3. You can also do animations to evaluate the movement of sargassum over time. And you can also download and obtain other water quality products available from these sensors. Also, if you're interested in processing the images and applying the algorithms yourself, then you can download uh, these images through the NASA Ocean Color Web using a level two browser at full resolution. And you can process these individual images or group of images using CDAS L2 Gen processor. CDAS is a free software for processing satellite imagery. If you will also like access to Sentinel-3 moderate resolution products, you can do the same procedure, download level two products and process them with SNAP software, which is very similar to CDAS in terms of uh, processing uh, satellite information and products. However, even with these amount of information that we can get through moderate resolution sensors, there are certain limitations in using these moderate resolution sensors like MODIS, VIRS, and OCHI. These can be excellent in open ocean. However, you cannot resolve sargassum patches in near shore areas or patches smaller than 100 meters of spatial resolution. So this is where high resolution sensors can be used to enhance the detection of sargassum. Like for example, the multispectral imagers on board Sentinel-2 satellite. In this image from Candorso and others, we have various high resolution sensors and it includes their bands and wavelengths and also their corresponding spatial resolution for each band. And as you can notice, these sensors have the bands required to apply the floating algae indices to detect sargassum and the spatial resolution to use them in near shore areas. However, we have a limitation on the temporal resolution seeing some of these sensors, like for example, Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8 can only have an image available every five to 10 days. And for Worldview 3, like the example shown here, most images are limited to a couple of in images per year. All sensor images shown here can be accessed free of charge, except for Worldview 3, which is a commercial sensor. We will show some examples of these high resolution images in the next slides. Here's a Landsat true color image for the area in Southwest Puerto Rico in La Parguera at 30 meters spatial resolution. You can clearly see the offshore keys present here as shown in previous slides uh, from Roy. These are, there are sargassum patches present here. However, these are very difficult to resolve in this true color image. But when we combine the bands and take advantage of the known spectral response of sargassum, we can create a false color image and detect sargassum very clearly. Now you can see the patches approaching the western side of La Parguera, where we have a large area of accumulation of sargassum. 
you can also define the coastal vegetation boundaries and even the small mangroves present in the offshore keys more clearly. We can also use these images to de detect and measure sargassum. Here we see an example of the floating algae index applied to a Sentinel-2 image, as I mentioned before. These algorithms can be applied to high-resolution images since we have the spectral bands required. And again, sargassum patches can be seen approaching the western side of La Barguera, and in the enhanced area on the bottom right shows the two major hotspot areas of chronic accumulation. Isla Cueva, which is at the center of the image, and Isla Guayacan, which is at the bottom left part of the image. The scale from blue to red, where red indicates higher presence of floating algae, and you can see that higher presence shown in these accumulation sites. So high resolution imagery can be used to detect sargassum in near shore areas effectively. One key aspect of our project is that through the NASA commercial small set data acquisition program, we have access to commercial multispectral high resolution sensors like Maxar, Digital Grow, Worldview 124, and also the Planetscope data, which has four bands and now eight bands with the super dope sensors. The graph on the right shows the planet scope sensors and spectral bands compared to the Sentinel-2 sensor, which again can be used to apply the floating algae indices. These images are excellent for change detection studies, so we can assess the changes in the benthic composition and the coastal vegetation at specific locations where sargassum accumulates. Here's an example of a planet scope true color image at three meters spatial resolution. And you can clearly see the details of this sargassum accumulation, even in the three true color image for the same site as the Sentinel-2 image we saw earlier. You can clearly define also the sargassum brown tide and black water present in the image. And it's also evident the sargassum accumulation at both Isla Cueva site and Isla Guayacan site. But when we combine the bands for a false color image, like you see here, the sargassum patches are more defined and can be separated from the coastal vegetation in the area. You can even separate sargassum previously accumulated versus fresh sargassum that has just arrived. And you can even define the fringing mangroves where it ends and where it starts and separate that from the sargassum accumulated at those locations. And at this special resolution, we can define and classify the sargassum accumulated here. And in this case, that sargassum accumulated has been labeled SA and the sargassum brown tide areas have been labeled SBT. So you can classify the image and quantify the sargassum present at that moment at that location. And using that level of detail, we can then make area estimates of the data accumulation shown here in acres of both sargassum accumulated and also the sargassum brown, brown tide. And as a surprise, we have been visiting this area for the last couple of years, but it were, I was really impressed of the large amount of sargassum accumulated there, which is not necessarily really readily appreciated on the field. Also, if you consider that this accumulation area can have one to two meters deep of sargassum accumulated there, you can have an idea of the amount of sargassum reaching this area and persisting at that location. We can also compare these calculations with other sensors, for example, Sentinel-2, and evaluate the total accumulation and persistence of this accumulation in this area. In addition to the planet scope data, we are now using very high spatial resolution sensors like Worldview 3, the image shown here. And this image is from February 2022, 
But one important aspect is that you can still see sargassum accumulated from the previous season that ended around October, November of 2021. We visited the field around the same time of the image collection and saw some seagrasses starting to recover in the accumulation zone. But these were covered again with the start of this 2020 sargassum season, season in late April of this year. And this is an example of the chronic effects of sargassum to benthic and coastal ecosystems. And as with the other images, we can use different band combinations to enhance certain aspects in the image. In this case, we use band combinations to enhance, enhance the benthic features and better define the coastal areas for those lengthy fixtures and sargassum. In terms of field work, we are using multi-parameter sounds to measure pH, temperature, dissolved oxygen, and turbidity, like the ones in the top right of the slide. The graph below shows an example of dissolved oxygen in milligrams per liter in the y-axis and the dates of sampling in the x-axis for two sites in southeastern Puerto Rico. And as you can see from the graph, low levels of dissolved oxygen are present already in May after the first arrivals of sargassum and persist throughout September. According to the uh, EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, levels less than three milligrams per liter are alarming and can have impact in certain marine organisms, but levels less than one milligram per liter are considered hypoxia. So it's very detrimental to marine life. In addition to the field work, we are also documenting sargassum observation using surveys via smartphones, where we collect location of sargassum, accumulation level, decomposition stage, if there are sea turtle presence or debris presence uh, brought up by that sargassum, and pictures of that accumulation. This allows us to validate the satellite imagery and observations for sargassum presence and extent. In the map below, all the red dots indicate observations collected using this survey from different sites. And the colored boxes represent the sites and pictures that were collected at different dates that show when sargassum was present at that particular site. And again, this helped us a lot with validation of the observations for sargassum presence in satellite imagery especially in nearshore areas. In addition to water quality, we are also collecting optical measurements, including the photosynthetically active radiation, or PAR, which is an important parameter for benthic communities. Here, we show PAR measurements in and out of our sargassum patch. The second column shows the measurements in open water with no sargassum, and the third column shows that same value inside the patch and you can clearly see the attenuation in par with depth. Very little light is coming through at three meter depth and that persists in deeper waters showing that sargassum attenuation effects of sargassum in light for benthic organisms. To supplement the observations we also added remote cameras that allow us to estimate sargassum accumulation and again, validate the sargassum presence for satellite imagery. Here we're showing an animation of a camera that was located in La Parguera. And you can see the sargassum patch coming in from the southeast uh, in the hour sequence and the, in the animation. Also, here's another camera, and this is a one week animation every hour for sargassum accumulating at Isla Guayacan site that was shown before in the satellite imagery. This allows us to estimate not only the presence of sargassum, but also the residence time of the sargassum at these locations. We're also adding drones to our field observations and provide more details into the areas of accumulation that are not seen clearly in the satellite imagery. This also allows us to differentiate the submerged sargassum at various locations. As you can see here in the image with that darker brown color. 
here's a video of, uh, in this case, Isla Cueva, and you can clearly see the extent of sargassum accumulation in the small inlets and bays created by the fringing mangroves. And you can also differentiate sargassum at various stages of the composition and that submerged sargassum from the fresh sargassum that had just arrived. We're also using drones. In this case, this is an offshore key in La Parguera. Again, showing that accumulation and the sargassum brown type presence, in this case, in the reef lagoon. So as Troy mentioned, very little is known of the effects of sargassum and these accumulations in coral reef areas. And this is an area that we're very interested in understanding for our project. We are also using drones to collect images and process them to estimate the area of coverage, like the sample we saw with the satellite imagery. And this, this will allow us not only to identify sargassum presence, but also improve our estimates of sargassum accumulation and extent. Here is a couple of sample images showing sargassum accumulated in, in an offshore reef in lagoons and in the right in area for marinas and areas used for boat access. So, so you have different locations and accumulations that you can do estimates and provide that information to managers for better use. Using a combination of satellite imagery and drones, we were able to publish an article last year where we assessed the impacts of sargassum in coastal vegetations using very high resolution satellite imagery like Worldview and validate that information using drones. For this research, we used the normalized difference vegetation index where we were able to document an accelerated loss of vegetation cover at the Isla Cueva site after 2018, where massive accumulations of sargassum have occurred and persisted throughout the years. The link for the article is provided. And now I'm gonna let Dr. Juan Torres with some concluding remarks for these projects. So thank you very much, Roy and William, for such uh, amazing information, uh, not only on uh, background information about sargassum and the status in the Caribbean, but also of all the different techniques that, uh, and tools that are being used to monitor sargassum, uh, not only in Puerto Rico, but also through the Caribbean and the Atlantic. So let's go into uh, just to kind of summarize what uh, what was uh, what we talked about today. Sargassum is definitely an, an essential ecosystem in the open ocean, but uh, but inundations of sargassum on the coastlines are negatively impacting the coastal resources and ecosystem these ecosystems as well as the the economy of many of these uh, these islands and 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 shorelines um, and. As uh, William uh, showed, there are different remote sensing uh, tools that can be used to observe and detect and even analyze the presence or, presence or absence of sargassum uh, using different band combinations and algorithms depending on the depending on the on the sensor and among other factors. And also, as William just uh, showed earlier uh, today, there you can there. You can combine multi multi scale remote sensing imagery with uh, field observations to have a much better understanding of acute and chronic effects of sargassum impacts in, along the coastal ecosystems. Ecosystems. There's always that we always mention in in our our webinars the importance of not only uh, working with uh, remote sensing imagery but also to have field observations to do the uh, image validation as well. And lastly, as a reminder, here are the contacts of uh, Amber and myself again. If you have any questions that we're not able to cover uh, today, feel free to send us an email. And also, I would like to remind you uh, that this is the RCET website. And, uh, and to encourage you to go into the website, there are a number of different topics that are 
that where we have uh, webinars that we've, we've done webinar, webinars over the years. All the materials are available uh, for your benefit. And also to consult our sister programs, DEVELOP and SERVIR. Uh, DEVELOP is a, is a capacity building program for uh, undergrad and grad students and, and recently graduates as well. And SERVIR has different hubs uh, through the world. And also to follow us on Twitter uh, to, to to make sure that you are updated and to the particularly on the on the webinars that are upcoming in the next several months and then thank you so much again for for uh participating today thanks again roy and william and we're gonna go now into the question and answer session Okay, let's go into the Q and A session. There's going to be there. There, there has been uh, several questions already from the audience. Thanks again for for those. Uh, some of them are uh, related to each other, so we have compile a uh, couple into into just a single question because they they're uh, related. And thanks again. Uh, we have uh, Roy and William, who we have also uh, with us uh, today to help uh, answering some of the questions. So what I will do is that I will I will uh, go through the questions and uh, and then Roy or, or William if you can open your your, your mics uh, then uh, then I'll let you expand on the uh, on the answers. Um, so thanks, Bjork, uh, for sharing the screen. The first one is uh, can sargassum be found in the Mediterranean Sea? Um, um, and, uh, and I know that uh, uh, Roy wrote here that uh, as far as he knows, uh, only benthic sargassum species are are found there. And uh, and yes, in fact, there are some uh, species that are uh, of sargassum that are even um, native to, uh, to the Mediterranean. Some of them are actually uh, have become extremely rare. Or, or even locally extinct. Um, uh, part of it is because there's a there's a different sargassum species, uh, sargassum muricum, that uh, that is also invasive and has uh, developed large populations in in, in coastal areas, and uh, and that uh, uh, it's, uh, potentially um, there's also been some some issues related to water turbidity and such in in the in the in the Mediterranean as well. Um, uh, there's a there's there's uh there's been some papers that have been published on the on, on sargassum the, uh, in the Mediterranean and I would make sure to include a couple of those uh, those uh, links in here in the in the final document. Yeah, uh, Juan, I would like to add something to this. Yeah. Is, um, during that 2010 winter, that uh, with that huge uh, anomaly of North Atlantic oscillation, the Sargassum reach at the coast of uh, the entrance of, of the Mediterranean up to G Gibraltar. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if some of it, some of these uh, pelagic sargassum entered the uh, the Mediterranean or impacted the coast of Spain and, and so on. But uh, as far as I know, there's there are no blooms or intrusions of sargassum there as as we have in the rest of the tropical Atlantic. So. I have not seen any reports of pelagic sargassum um, in the Caribbean area. Great. Um, okay, so let's go to the uh, question number two. Uh, it's uh, more of a comment from from some from one of our participants uh, who made a visit, a field visit, and took advantage of a very low tide to look at different animal and plant species that colonized the the, uh, the study area. Um, and he's uh, the person is asking: Are all species are small and are all present in the same place? So how can we distinguish them? Is it is there is there a characteristic spectral signature practical in this case? Right, you wanna take that, Roy? Uh, sure. Yes. Um, well, it will be helpful to know exactly what type of organisms you are looking at, but in, in, in all cases, it, it helps a lot if you know the taxonomy, you know exactly where you're looking at, because most of the spectral signatures are based on the different pigment. 
And I put an example here of cnidarians, you know, the corals, you know, hard corals, sub corals, and, and so on, that have sosanthelli, and uh, the pigments uh, then can be used to differentiate them, although they are animals. And in plants, the same thing, you know, different pigments will also uh, provide different uh, optical properties. So in some cases, uh, the spectral features uh, could be used to differentiate them, but in most cases, it is very, very hard to separate uh, most of the benthic species that you see based only on, on spectral signatures. Exactly, exactly. And uh, and we may even, at, at least for the, kind of to expand on what Roy said, uh, uh, we, 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 uh, we published a couple of papers on the on spectral signatures of corals in particular from the from the Caribbean, um, both uh, Roy and I uh, are co-authors on those, on those papers. So we might, uh, we, we will include the links here just for as a, as a, for uh, references, uh, reference uh, purposes uh, here. But uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's really hard to to distinguish them from from the spectral signatures. Uh, only um, <clears throat> we in those we we use a combination of spectral signatures with uh, pigment analysis from which HPLC. Uh, to to try to separate them, but uh, but yeah, there's still a lot a lot of work that needs to be done uh, in that particular field. Okay, number three. There's been a couple of questions related to the AFAI uh, algal index. Uh, one of them is uh, here's on uh, number three that's, that's asking about which are the variables that uh, that are included on which this in index is based on and. Uh, what information can you uh, provide? We we included here the link to the to the Wang and and Chaming Hu's uh, paper to, from 2016 that describes the 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 FAA uh, index uh, as a reference. I don't know if uh, Royal William wanna wanna, wanna uh, provide more more details or yeah, yes, one um, adding adding to that the uh, the 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 paper. Uh linked here shows the algorithm, but uh, you can also, as I mentioned in the presentation, you can also uh, download uh, the level two data from NASA Ocean Color and apply yourself the using the L2Gen, which is a processing uh, uh, routine available for CDAS program, for the CDAS software. And you can, and if the algorithms for Floating algae index and alternate floating algae index are already in there, so you will get a final product after you process that imagery. Uh, that's that's uh, the best scenario that I that I can I can think of in using that data directly. But remember, you need to download the data and process it yourself in getting to know the CDAS processing uh, software. True, true. That's very true. And uh, and actually on the on the same topic, uh, I'm glad that William mentioned CDAS. We, as I mentioned, uh, I think it was uh, last week and the first or during the second session, uh, we did in our set last year. We did uh, two different webinars on the transition from MODIS to VIRS, um, and uh, at least the first. Well, actually, both of them they included um, uh, demos step-by-step uh, -step demos on how to, uh, precisely on how to download data from from CDAS and how to do some processing uh, there at, uh, <clears throat> with, with some of the indices as, as well. So uh, make sure that uh, that you go back to, to those uh, to those webinars and uh, uh, for those of you who are who are interested in, in, in this thing in particular. And uh, and again, we'll we'll include again the the, the URLs for the for the for those. Uh, for those two webinars that were were taught uh, uh, last year, towards the end of the year. Um, number four is asking: Is Beers data freely available? Yes, it is. And uh, uh, and again, it's uh, it, it can be obtained through the through the Ocean Color website, uh, and there's a link uh, of the Ocean Color website. Uh, number five is uh, similar to to number three that that, that William just answered. Uh, it's uh, again on, on how to calculate the FAA index and uh, is it applicable to drones too, or the, what are the differences between 
FAA and AFAA. And, uh, and we, again, uh, refer back to the Wang and Who 2016 paper here. Um, and uh, um, Roy, I noticed that you had it uh, a little bit there if you wanna, you wanna go over it. Okay, Juan, I was trying to answer another one. So we are on the uh, question five on the on the whether it's uh, whether the the indices are applicable to drone data. Oh, okay, yes. So the the RGB of of, of drone cameras is 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 not enough to, as far as I know, to calculate this index. Uh, this index is very specific using some channels in the near IR. So um, if you have a small uh, multispectral camera that you can put on, on a drone that includes those uh, bands, those specific bands for that used to calculate the index, then yes, then you can uh, uh, derive that from, from a drone. It will be basically the same as doing it from a satellite, but uh, at a much better spatial resolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I also want to mention here that uh, and, and William, this is this, uh, this is uh, this is some of your your slides, but uh, but the uh, as a reference also remember, remember that for the AFAI in particular, the bands that you're interested in in using is the the red band and 667 nanometers, uh, the near infrared and 748, and the SWIR uh, band at 869 nanometers uh also so goes yeah. back again to what roy was just uh, saying about about uh, the drone data having those specific bands yes and 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 one addition in the also in the processing and I did, this applies to both floating algae index and alternate floating algae index is that the even though you're take you're using a level two image you need to take into account that you'll need to uh do what we call a land mask or, or and cloud mask your images because you don't want uh, the algorithm to be confused with areas specifically specifically thin clouds that may appear in the imagery that could uh, provide false positives for sargassum presence. So that's something to take into account that pre-processing uh, procedures uh, uh, to apply to the image before applying the algorithms. Uh, and with drones, I'd like to add that what Roy mentioned is that uh, not only that, but remember that uh, drones, uh, since you're collecting uh, very high resolution information, other factors come into account. Like, for example, uh, uh, sun glint, reflectance, and, and, and other factors for when collecting that, that data that you need to take into account uh, uh, before processing the imagery. So that, that's that's some uh, minor, uh, small t tips that you can take before uh, processing directly the images or applying the algorithms by yourself. Exactly. Thanks, William. Okay, let's go to uh, number six here. Um, are sargassum blooms a natural barrier against wave action and reduce the energy of the swell? Also, uh, can I use NDAVI index for mapping? The, the repartition of sargassum blooms, such as uh, Posidonia in the Mediterranean Sea, for southern coastal refraction and diffraction of the swell in the coastal area. This is quite a complicated question with, with multiple multiple questions here, but uh, but we'll, uh, we'll we'll do our best. Uh, Roy, if you want to take uh, some of it, and then or William, and then and then. I can I can add on. Which which question I kind of lost the which question is it? Sorry, one. Uh, uh, the number six. Uh, number six. Okay. Uh, well, I, I, what I've seen and in, in some island nations in the Caribbean, especially in beaches with high energy, I mean high way back, uh, the sargassum that is there uh, has been mixed with sand to stabilize the uh the beach in this case the slope of the beach so it will minimize the erosion um, but i've not seen any like published articles or uh, peer review articles or or reports uh on this but 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 since it is the sargassum is accumulated on site 
and some of these locations are very remote, which sargassum cannot be removed from the beach, so they use that for stabilization. So I don't know if that answers the question or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I will add on to the NDAVI specifically um, what we uh, that uh, that we showed on the on session one. Uh, the NDAVI, the difference between the NDAVI and the and the and the uh, the greatly used uh, uh, NDVI is that the NDAVI uh, uses the blue band instead of the of the red band that that uh, which the the ND, NDVI uh, uses. And and the and the NDAVI what, what we showed that, that was that it was uh, that it was useful for detecting um, um, like seagrass beds. Uh, in this case, um, it's uh, the, the 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 person is asking about Posidonia in particular. But also remember that uh, that these uh, indices, a lot of these indices, particularly the ones that use uh, you know the, the bands in the near infrared and such. Um, they they work to an extent uh, to some extent and uh, um, and uh, that will it will also be they be affected on on whether the the aquatic vegetation is actually uh, submerged or is it floating or, or such. Remember that again as we mentioned before and um, in the regions like the near infrared uh, there's a great absorption by the water itself. So uh, and uh, uh, and most of the energy there is absorbed in the first you know, first centimeters or so of a, of a, of depth. So so it's uh, you need to take into account of whether whether the vegetation the vegetation is actually at the surface or it's uh, below the surface, and that will that will be a factor affecting the detection of of, of these. Okay, number seven then. Um, are these satellites uh, with these resolutions available for free or, or for sale, particularly Worldview and, and PlanetScope? Um, th that's uh, those two are those are uh, commercial satellite data, and uh, so they are. You have to you have to 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 to, to buy them, to buy the the, the image. Um, it depends, and and uh, I'm not, Definitely, William, you're more, much more familiar with this than, than myself. But it will depend on the size of the of the area that you're requesting. Uh, uh, that will be that will be one of the factors determining the cost of, of a particular image. Yes, and uh, that's that's uh, a good uh, answer. One and uh, my experience with uh, uh, for research purposes, or specifically for planet scope, and even worldview, is that. Uh, uh, you can do uh, small requests for, for let's say, sampling uh, or maybe applying the products to certain areas. Uh, so, so I encourage you to contact uh, uh, both uh, PlanetScope and, uh, in this case, Maxar Digital Globe and make your request directly to them. So that could, they could then uh, process it accordingly. In in our case, it is it, it is for this is it is part of our. Uh, uh, NASA project, so we we have access to those images. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Uh, question number eight, and uh, it says the impact of large uh, the large sargassum patch on the underwater light field. Why does PAR with sargassum increase at attenuates with depth? Isn't it the opposite to that uh, observed for blue water? I can take that one, Juan. Yeah. What happened here was that we were out and decided to go into this huge sargassum patch uh, out in the open ocean in the boat. And when we got to the center, it was very hard. You know, we were in a 40, 41 foot, you know, boat. So um, we I started deploying the light meter and we realized that it was a very thick um, patch. It was so close to a meter thick, you know, in depth of, of sargassum. So that's why you see the first few meters uh, values uh, at, at zero, basically, because it was completely covered, the, the sensors by by a very thick sargassum. So, and then once it cleared that and, and encountered uh, clear water under the patch, the shadow was so large 
that the light that was uh, recording, it came from scattering of light from outside the patch, okay? Because no light was going through that patch, at least no measurable light. And as we were going deeper, you will see that some maybe some of the values starting to increase. And the reason is that more light was being scattered and coming from the uh, borders of the patch, you know, and that's what we were measuring. So that's why you see that um, anomaly that, that you identified was because of the nature of that sargassum patch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. It's, uh, it's pretty impressive. Uh, I've had the opportunity of, of, of uh, diving below the sargassum patches and uh, and yes it gets pretty dark really really fast <laughs> okay um does eutrophication number nine eutrophication promote the rapid uh, propagation of sargassum i can take that one also um well eutrophication occurs because there is a lot of nutrients right so if you see a, a a lot of um, algae, you know, green water, it means that already utilize the nutrients for the most part. But if, if, if it's a constant source and, and there are nutrients freely available, I would imagine that, yes, it could uh, benefit sargassum growth, you know, from the nutrients. So um, the answer could be, yes, it's possible. Mm -hmm. All right, number 10, how do I, differentiate the floating dead and decaying plant matter from sargassum species? Good question there. Um, well, th what happens is while it's, it's in the ocean floating, it's, uh, it's alive. And uh, yes, it might be decaying somehow if it's very old from what we have seen. And it gets to a point that starts losing the um, the um, pneumatos, I, I always forget, pneumatocysts, and, and then it sinks, and then you, see, you don't see it anymore. But once it gets to the shore and beaches, and then rapid decay and decomposition takes place, and then uh, it, it obviously sinks. So I don't know if that answers the question. Juan, do you have anything to, to add? Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. And uh, and actually, there was a. Uh, I was looking for it as as you were uh, answering, uh, Roy. Uh, there's a paper from Heidi Dearson from uh, several years ago. Uh, she did with with one of her students, and uh, which speaks specifically about about uh, separating or differentiating between, and the, in that case, I believe it was between dead uh, seagrass and, uh, and other uh, types of, uh, of, of aquatic vegetation. Um, it was a paper for some, some years ago. I'll, I'll make sure that we include the link here, but uh, that could, be, could also be useful uh, for, for, uh, for, this, uh, for the person uh, asking this one in particular. OK. Um, with regards in 11 with regards to the uh to floating mat sargassum how is, is it detected when it's submerged in water after one year of its formation what do the spatial data sets look like for such uh, submerged sargassum yeah yeah Juan, i i added there that uh it's, I mean, some birch sargassum can be distinguished from floating sargassum by using the, the indices, uh, floating algae and alternate floating algae indices. Because since I use near infrared bands, these bands do not penetrate a water column. So you can get that sargassum, even though it's maybe partially floating, you can still get a signal uh, of that floating sargassum. However, the old sargassum that it, that it goes and, and sinks to the bottom, it remains there, and if it stays there for a long time, which happens at some places that we visit, it, from satellite imagery, it can be confused by mud or other or consolidated sediments. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, so you need to know uh, if what you're seeing is sargassum uh, that is accumulated in, in the bottom, or it has maybe uh, uh, moved or 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 been been flushed away or maybe transition or decay so much that is now part of the mud or or sand that is located there. 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, there's a, there was a, one last question here that was posted. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys can 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 answer it. That's on the use of, of SAR data. Can, can it be useful for identifying large course concentration of sargassum or other submerged aquatic vegetation in, loca in locations that have high high cloud cover? I can I can try that. Um, I don't see why not. Why at SAR data probably can identify very large patches and thick patches of floating sargassum, okay? But not submerged aquatic vegetation. That's because of, you know, it has no water penetration properties, you know, microwaves. Mm -hmm. and, and I have a student that is looking at, uh, he has a lighter in his drone and he flew it over a sargassum patch and he could detect the patch, you know, based on the on the uh, structure of, of the sargassum that was above the water surface. So, so he realized that you could detect sargassum just based on, on that surface the manifestation of it, as long as it's floating, compared to the water next to it that is, has none of it. So I would imagine that with SAR data would be something similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a it's a good question, and uh, we might even uh, reach out to to our colleague uh, Erika Podest, who's a uh, who's the one of the experts in in, in SAR, in particular in uh, JPL. Um, okay, uh, there's there's a uh, there's one that I'm I'm seeing here in the in the chat. Um, uh, how do we estimate the biomass of sargassum? Okay, so first you need to know the area and the volume, okay? The area is very easy with satellite data, especially the high spatial resolution sensors. The volume um, is, is more difficult and that's one of the things that, um, I know there's been some attempts and some of the people and there have been something published on, on estimates of volume. So that's to be something more empirically oriented that you do it in the field and related to, to the spectral data that, that you're getting to get to volume. But um, so, but then you have to get to biomass, right? So uh, then you need to know how much biomass is per area and per volume. But for that, definitely you need to collect it, uh, collect that volume and dry it you know, to constant weight. So, you know, the, the biomass that is associated to that volume of sargassum. Yes, and, and adding to that, Roy, and, and, and that is something that is currently being, I mean, it's, it's an area of, of current research because it's, it's sargassum, the contribution of sargassum uh, uh, and the biomass, and in, the case, in this case, the, the carbon content on specific locations where we get Huge sargassum accumulations. If it's, it's it's an area, I mean, of of of, of current research because I mean the, the, it, it readily affects the biogeochemical cycles of those sites uh, by adding you're adding biomass and carbon content and also uh, decomposition products to those locations. So that so from a biological and ecological perspective, uh, uh, that is a key question that uh, uh, is is a current area of research. Uh, and it's, it's, it's something that we just, we're, like Ray mentioned, is we're still uh, uh, evaluating some techniques that will get us uh, good estimates, especially with volume, to be included in the total biomass uh, estimations. Great, thanks both. And uh, one last one, uh, is there, and uh, I, 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 Roy went over this uh, during his talk, but, uh, but uh, kind of as a refresher, is there any seasonal variation in the pattern of sargassum uh, distribution? Um, yes, there is. I can, I can speak to what I have observed in, in Puerto Rico, that uh, it arrives in the late spring and the peaks in the summer months. But some of the um, uh, peak years, we have seen uh, sargassum uh, extending all the way to December and so forth. Uh, in this year, for example, the first intrusion of sargassum, I mean, big one, was in, in April 29th. And it's been on and off 
and we expect it to increase now for the rest of, of the summer. But after the summer, it usually you know, um, is much reduced and that will be the, the end of the season. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and adding to that seasonal variation, I mean, sargassum, it's, it's one key thing here to understand is sargassum is present in the Caribbean and in the waters around the Caribbean, uh, uh, it only, I mean, sometimes depending on the uh, uh, orientation of the island, in this case, uh, Puerto Rico is ori ori oriented in the east to west. So once, once we get a change in the wind patterns, which usually happens sometimes in the summer, a southerly wind will bring that sort of those orgasm patches uh, uh, into areas which sometimes don't see that accumulation until that happens. So, so it's very susceptible to wind patterns and the uh, geographic location of the different islands in the Caribbean, in addition to the seasonal variation. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, yeah, I think uh, well, there was a, uh, um, okay. There was a one very last one that's that uh, that just someone just wrote it in the in the chat about in the 2018 is the 2018 sargassum bloom somehow related to changes in the North Equatorial Counter Current? Can satellite altimetry uh, be used simultaneously to study sargassum interannual variability? Okay, well, uh, overall, I can say that um, all, every year since 2011, the blooms that, that we see in the Caribbean uh, comes from that new source that we describe of the coast of Africa, right? So um, the specific um, instances of, of uh, of the sargassum coming to a specific area in the Caribbean has to do, of course, with the um, with the currents and and so forth. Like even what William was saying about uh, reaching the shore areas. So apparently in 2018, you know the the conditions were right for massive proliferation of sargassum of Africa from different nutrient sources and and, and so forth. Um, interesting. In 2013, there was no event of sargasso in the area, and I have not seen any reports in the literature explaining why. So uh, that will be something interesting to, to look for. And if altimetry can be used to study sargasso variability, um, that's a good question. We have to check that with people that use uh, those kinds of data to see uh, if it can be used for this, that's, I really don't know. Okay, all right, um, before we, we leave, I, I wanna mention that I, I'm going back to question number 10 there on, the, on, on differentiating between the floating dead and decayed plant matter and sargassum species. I, I found the, the, the link to, the, to Heidi Dearsons and, uh, uh, and Russell's paper from uh, from 2015 on remote sensing on the environment. On, and then in, the, in their case, they use hyperspectral data uh, to discriminate the uh, floating mats of, of, of seagrass rack uh, um, and uh, and sargassum in the coastal waters of uh, of Florida. Uh, with, in this case, the uh, hyper, hyperspectral uh, airborne remote sensing. Um, but uh, but uh, but that's a that's a good reference there. Um, uh, in regards to, to this uh, specific question. Okay, um, all right, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for participating today. Thanks, Roy and William, again, for um, uh, for helping us with this uh, with this webinar series and for, for all the details that you provided. Um, I wanna remind our participants that uh, that uh, if you want for in order to get the certificate of completion make sure that you submit the the homework through google forms the link is already on the on the website 
of the of our uh of, of this uh webinar series Thanks again for all the support, uh, and uh, and and we hope uh, we hope that uh, the information that we provided here is uh, useful for you. And stay tuned for for upcoming webinars uh, uh, on on our set. Uh, make sure that you go get into uh, into Twitter or just follow us on Twitter or follow us, follow us uh, through even through our web page uh, to uh, stay updated on 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 new webinars. And uh, and with that. Uh, have a have a wonderful day and then uh we'll stay tuned we'll we'll see you then thanks Gloria and William <laughs>